Rohit. Yeah. As we move to the next season of God's work, it's amazing that God is interested in the lives of each one of us and is interested in making us a community that belongs to him. Okay? And one of the ways he makes his community belong to him is by constantly revealing what God wants to do in the lives of people. Okay? It's interesting. If your life is without God, listen to me carefully, church. If your life is without God, you're on a cyclic journey. You will eat, sleep, pay your bills, eat, sleep, work, pay your bills, eat, sleep, work more, pay your bills, one day, drop dead. One day, drop dead. But if your life is inclined with God, it's a linear journey, and you're walking from one step to another step, to another step, another step, and future in God is exciting. Hallelujah. If you read the book of Judges, or the book of Joshua, or the book of Exodus, a bunch of six million people went on a circlic journey, the book of Numbers. Eat, sleep, eat, sleep, work, finished. If you think one day your company is going to come, by the way, I'm not a full-time pastor, I work for a company and I travel 26 days in a month, so I understand what your work is, okay? I understand. I've been in the secular world. I'm still in the secular world. I understand what it is. But I want to tell you this, my friends. If you're not engaged with God, if you're not connected with God, you are not moving forward. It's not a linear journey. It's a cyclic journey. 2020 will remain the same. 21 will remain the same. 22 will remain the same. And it will go on to remain the same. Nothing has changed. People come and tell me, you know, I want to become like this. You will not become like that because you are a cyclic. Nothing has changed. You have not let go on anything. You have not moved forward. God called his first bunch of slaves by a name in the, in the Bible called Hebrew. Hebrew. The word Hebrew means, I'm going to just come forward. Okay? The word Hebrew means the one who moves, 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 moves. Sorry, that's my son, I can do it. That is the word Hebrew. Hebrew is not getting stuck. I move, he doesn't move. I move, he doesn't move. I don't. No, 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 that's not Hebrew. Hebrew is a guy, when God speaks, moves. And then God comes, moves. Hallelujah. And then the bunch of slaves call themselves Jews. The word Jew comes from the word Judah. Which means praise, praise, praise. And God called us, each one of us by name. He came to Mahima, he came to Divya, he came to Sophia. Hey, come in, join my kingdom. And then he grafted us into the line of Hebrew, into the line of a Jew, not to live depressed lives, but to say, praise God, I'm moving forward. Praise God, I'm moving forward. Sit down, Anugrah. Hebrew's life is moving forward. One who presses forward. And for that, you need to have a journey map of where we are heading. Okay? It's important for our headway, not our destination. Destination God reveals as you move forward. But you need to have a vision and a journey for your direction, for your headway. Which direction I need to know? Why I need to have a journey path? It's very important for me to have a journey path because Jesus in his enormous wisdom, talking to people, I come from a Brahmin background, unlike a Christian home, grew up as a Brahmin, worshipped a pious worshipper, didn't know. Like the majority of the Hindus who worship idols, I worship in the majority. Till I found the narrow path, Jesus said, my way is not a highway. It's the narrow way. I don't know how many of you walked on a narrow path. When you walk on a narrow path, you're careful. You're careful. You're looking. 
left, right, and center. You don't just walk blindly on a narrow path. And walk with Jesus is careful. Is careful. You take steps of faith because it's a narrow road and you don't want to miss the direction on the narrow road. Hallelujah. There are no road signs on a narrow road. How many of you walk through a wheat field or a, or a, or a, or a paddy field? You'll find the farmer knows exactly how he should take on the narrow So is the narrow road that Jesus spoke in the, to, his, to his people. My way is narrow. If you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, life is going to become difficult for you. It has become difficult for me the day I came to the Lord Jesus Christ. My problems increased. When I took water baptism, my problems increased furthermore. When I began to start a church, problems increased furthermore. When I started another branch, problems increased furthermore. When we plant another church, some more problems will increase. Somebody say amen, yeah? Walking with Jesus, progressiveness is more battles. It's more battles. Starting this church was a battle. Starting South Church is a battle. Southing East Church is another battle. Starting a West Church is another battle. Starting a North Church is another battle. But every battle we will overcome because Jesus is the winner man. Amen. Hallelujah. Through our God, we shall do valiantly. But the path is a narrow path. It's a narrow road, my friends. If somebody has told you walking with Jesus is a highway, they've told you a lie. Jesus said, narrow is my road. Narrow is my gate. Not many find it, Jesus said. Very few find it. And the Hebrew or the Greek word for few is what you can count in your hands. Are you with me? So small and so insignificant. If you don't have a vision... Others will impose their plans on us and hence God's purpose on our story will get distracted. If you remember, I always said this, don't invite somebody who's going to another church to come to our church. Correct? First of all, it is sinful. It's called stealing in the Bible. What is it called? Tell your neighbor, stealing. We don't steal. Okay? We don't steal. We are people who respect somebody else who builds his church in the way God gave him the pattern and we are blessed he's building it in that pattern. Hallelujah. We don't say our pattern is nice, our pattern is the best. Never. Don't do that. If you've done it, ask God to forgive you. Okay, seek his forgiveness. But we look for people who want to build God's kingdom together with us on this journey that God has called us for. We don't want them to come and give us blueprints of what they were doing in their church. That's fine. That's a calling God has done for them. We are grateful. But as a community of God's people, we want to be imposed by what God called us to build. Hallelujah. God has called us to build something. And that is what is. Lastly, clarity is the need as we move forward. So you can decide whether to be part of it not to be part of it. I like Stanley's. I don't know how many of you heard Stanley's kite model. He's got a kite model. Those of you who spent time, or oh, when Stanley comes, talk to him and ask him. It's his favorite. He speaks from his radial artery. That kite now comes from his deep passion. Kesat, he'll explain to you. He talks about the kite. He says, a church comprises of contacts, congregation, committed people. Then he talks about the core. Correct? Crowd, okay? It talks about the congregation, uh, before the congregation, the crowd. Then he talks about congregation, committed, core, okay? He says, you have to decide who you are. Crowds followed Jesus Christ. Crowds followed Jesus Christ, but their lives were not on the vision of Jesus Christ. They came, tali bajaya, kana khaya, chala gaya. Correct? 5,000, 2,000, 3,000 feeding. They were all part of the meal services. Or oh, enjoyed the fun. Achha dikta hai, sinma dikta hai. Healing. But Jesus called his people to transit from crowds. Few became committed people. Okay, that's it. Clarity sets you. Decide whether you want to be in the crowd 
Or today you can say, well, I am excited about where the church is going. I want to be in. I want to be in. If you read the book of Judges, two million men were there. Two million men. You know how many people got elected out of two million? Twelve people. And one of them happens to be a woman, Deborah. Twelve people out of two million people. The book of Judges. Twelve people were elected to, to actually form and address issues in their crisis. And each issue is a very unique issue. The whole book of Judges covers about 200 years of Israel history. And about, if you calculate every time there is a deliverer, like Samson delivered the people and it says there was peace for 80 years. If you add all of it, it sums to about 400 years. God raised people in different pockets, gave them a vision to address a particular issue in that particular place. That's the clarity. So you can decide whether you want to move forward or not to move forward. Jesus said to his disciples, don't put your hands on the plow and turn behind. What did he say? You know why did he say this? Why do you think he said that? Once you put your hand and turn behind, you will mess up the whole field. Are you with me, my friends? Because a bull will go the way it wants to go and somebody else who's already sowed, his field also is going to get corrupt. So decide before you put your hands. Nobody is forcing you to take up any responsibility, my friends. But if you've decided to put your hands, my request is, don't spoil the field. Somebody else has plodded straight. Somebody else has planted the seeds. And somebody else is working hard to see. Because if you turn back and watch a movie, the bull will go messing around the entire place. Little bit of farming, if you understand. Clarity. And Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, Put your hands on the plow. Only if you have decided. And he gave them two stories, very strong stories. If any man who wants to fight a big army, first he calculates his army, does all the calculations, and then decides to fight. Second story he said, if any man wants to build his house, he will calculate what is the total cost, and then decide. To. And he told them, because if he doesn't decide the cost, he will make a blunder and the mess Think. I'm teaching from the Bible two stories. How should our journey be? Very interesting. Last year in the month of November, as I was waiting for the next season of vision, God spoke to me from the book of Deuteronomy. And he used the word Gilgal. Okay? And I call that, this is what God said, remain in Gilgal. The plan was to plant the West Church and the East Church. Some genesis of it last year. But when we got this word, I told my team of elders, we are not going to extend. We are just going to stop where we are. We are not going to move forward. 2019 was a year of consolidation. Are you with me, church? It was a year of consolidation. God told me, I want you, Ashok, to remain where you are. No extension. Don't start anything new. Remain in Gilgal. At that time, when we called it year of consolidation, none of us knew what the year of consolidation really meant. But we prayed two prayers in the January 1st, those of you who were there. We prayed, God, whatever is not of ours, let it fall off. That's our prayer. Second prayer we prayed, God, if we have blundered anywhere. Help us to see our blunders so that we don't build the church in the wrong direction. But we will wait, we will wait in Gilgal. And the year 2019 was a year of Gilgal. We remained. We have not planted any new project. We just waited on God and in the next two days, the year of consolidation comes to an end. Are you with me, my friends? So 2019, for the history of NFC, was a year of consolidation. Because by then, we had crossed the big Jordan River. The big Jordan River is when we didn't know how we are going to pay for this hall. We didn't know we took up another hall on top. We don't know how we are going to pay. But we crossed those barriers. And God has brought us to a place of extension. God made them cross Jordan. 
and said, stay before you stop, before you capture anymore. Remain at Gilgal. Stay put at Gilgal. Okay? And I'm going to help you to look at what does Gilgal really mean. Okay? We don't know how many Gilgals are there in the Bible. Some scholars say it's on the eastern side of Jordan. Some say it is 70 miles north of Jordan. But most of the Bible scholars say the word, of, word Gilgal in the Bible is a very symbolic, significant name. Okay? There are 39 verses mentioned about Gilgal as if one verse for every book in the Old Testament. I don't know. As if. It's like one in every book. Every book that you read, there is one word, Gilgal. So there is no specific. Till to date, they could not pinpoint, is it a geographical location or is it a symbolic act of God? So Gilgal was a standstill place as far as people are concerned. I'm going to give you some interesting facts of what happened at Gilgal. Okay? Gilgal certainly had a strong ritual significance in the Bible and an association for strong military conquest and new beginnings. That's what Gilgal actually meant. It meant that if you have been in Gilgal, the next phase is massive conquests. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen, yeah? Okay. And then if you've been in Gilgal, the next phase is new beginnings. Hallelujah. Okay. So we've been in Gilgal for a year. Some of you stood with me. We've been here for a year. The next season is a year of conquest and a year of new beginnings. Are you with me? Okay, good. If you want to clap, clap to the Lord. Put your hands together. So, what happened at Gilgal? I have read through the Bible and there are 15, 15 instances I can read out for you. There are more. But let me read out 15 instances that I've, that I've, those of you taking down notes, you can maybe write down the verse for you to go. Gilgal was the first place Joshua and his children Israel camped after the miraculous crossing of the Jordan River. Joshua chapter 4 verse 19. Joshua chapter 4 verse 19. So Gilgal, I'm giving you 15 events of Gilgal. So that if you know, understand the Bible. That's the first place where Joshua and his people whom God has called has now camped before they occupy the promised land that God has given them. Hallelujah. It's an amazing place. The second significance about Gilgal. Joshua commanded and actually at Gilgal, he handpicked 12 anointed leaders from each tribe who will lead the nation of Israel. Joshua Chapter 4, verses 1 to 9, and, chapter, uh, and verses 20 to 24. You can go back and read those verses. Joshua used that place, Gilgal, to select his key leaders. Are you with me, church? At Gilgal, he selected who should be the one who will take the tribe of Dan forward. Who should be the one who will take the tribe of Nephtali ahead. Who should be the one who will take the tribe of Fistashar? He selected each one of them in the directions he's going to go to plant God's kingdom. Are you with me? Some went up Jordan. Some went east Jordan. Some went down Jordan. Some went west Jordan. Two and a half tribes settled down on the eastern side of Jordan. Sizable of them settled down on the central part of Jordan. But he selected 12 tribes who will lead the plan of God at Gilgal. Don't seem to be excited, church. Guys, say hallelujah something, yeah? Third, at Gilgal, an Israelite man who had grown up, all the Israelite men who had grown up for 40 years, wandering in the desert, all their fathers died, and a new generation was raised up. He actually circumcised them at Gilgal. Joshua chapter 5, verse 2. He took a brand new bunch of people at Gilgal, and said, guys, the past is gone. The old is gone. People have disappeared. They have left behind. But you are the bunch of people who are going to build the kingdom. And then he renewed a covenant with them at Gilgal. Circumcision was done there. Are you excited? A lot of facts about Gilgal. Okay. Fourth, at Gilgal also celebrated, Israelites also celebrated the first Passover for the first time in the Holy Land. 
the day they reached Gilgal, the very next day, manna stopped coming. Hallelujah. And they started to eat from what the land produced. It happened at Gilgal. Joshua chapter 5, verse 10. They were eating their past divine provision. But now God said, I have fed you enough. I have fed you so much of heavenly manna. The land will produce for you. Hallelujah. God said, the land will produce at Gilgal. This year has been a great learning for us as a church. God will build his church. He will give every resource that we need. He will give every resource that we need. It doesn't come from the men's bank balance. He will ensure the land will produce what it's needed for his people. Are you with me? Great. Some of you may be having a Gilgal experience as I'm sharing these instances to you. Look at your own life and say, thank you God for the year of consolidation. Fifth thing that happened at Gilgal, the Gibeonites who were inhabitants of the land deceived Joshua into making him a treaty to save themselves. At Gilgal, the leader whom God called has been deceived by one of the people that he was supposed to capture. Hallelujah. Interesting, correct? It happened at Gilgal. Some deceived, many deceived. And Joshua was very upset that you deceived me. You have deserted me. Why did you do such kind of a thing? Go back and read Joshua 9 and you'll know the whole story of what happened at Gilgal. Joshua and the people were upset with the deception. Very upset. Deceived Joshua into making an error. Sixth event that happened at Gilgal. Gilgal was Joshua's base for operations for Israel. Initial conquest of the Holy Land, including his honoring of the treaty for the tribes that deceived him and another nation that he was inhabiting. Joshua began capturing the new land that God has called at Gilgal. Joshua began his journey. Seven, the angel of the Lord went from Gilgal. Okay, this sixth principle, Joshua chapter 10, verse 6 to 15. You'll find those answers and 40 to 43. An angel of the Lord went from Gilgal to a place called Bochim to actually chastise Israelites for breaking the covenant with God. At Gilgal, there was an angel that appeared and rebuked the key leaders and said that what you did is wrong. Joshua chapter, Judges chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Okay? Eighth, Ehod, one of the judges or a regional leader of Israel, a famous left-hand man in the Bible. Many of you know the left-hand man is in the cricket team, correct? There's one lefty in the Bible. His name is Ehud. Okay? Interesting man. Interesting story. He actually killed a kill king called Eglon. And he killed him. Eglon was so fat, so fat, that actually the Bible says when he put his sword, 18-inch blade sword, into Eglon's stomach, the fat closed over his hand. Yucky, isn't it? Then he could not pull the sword out. He left the sword and the fat closed in the sword and the sword disappeared. From, I mean, it got merged into his body. Such was the fat. In the, and Ehod was a left hand. And this man, this man, turned back from Gilgal to assassinate a king who was troubling him for eight years. He killed him. He dealt with it. He dealt with him at Gilgal. Nine. Gilgal was one of the places of the circuit that Samuel, the first leader since Joshua, to be recognized throughout Israel and travel to provide judgments of Israel. In the book of Judges, there was not a single national leader. Soon after the book of Judges completed, you'll come to Samuel, and Samuel became the first national leader who consolidated all the teams. And he became the leader to lead the tribe of the nation of Israel. Okay? We have a vision of planting south, east, west, Romania, Alaska. And a day will come when God will appoint a leader who will consolidate that like Samuel to build the church forward as he called it up. Are you with me, church? Are you exciting way we are seeing? Gilgal. Tenth event. Uh, the, 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 the circuit is 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 15 to 17. The tenth event. The king of Saul, the first king of Israel, was actually crowned at Gilgal. Is Gilgal making sense now? So many events in the Bible. 1 Samuel 
chapter uh, 1 Samuel chapter 11 verse 14 to 15 also 1 Samuel chapter 10 verses 1 and 8 you will find this it was he who was appointed to become the king 11th event at Gilgal however at Gilgal was also a Saul ignored God's commandments and therefore Samuel informed Saul you are no more needed for God's kingdom that's the message he said he met him up and said, Saul, you are no more useful for God's kingdom. You are finished. Where did he do that? Where did he do that? At Gilgal. There's a change of leadership at Gilgal. 1 Samuel, okay, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1 to 15, and 1 Samuel chapter 15. Both verses give you that key, okay? Event number 12. Or after King David's son Absalom mounted an unsuccessful revolt against King David, David was greeted by his people, reaffirmed as a king, and the king was put back in his throne in the, in, the book of, in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 19. And that place where they did that was called Gilgal. Is it making some sense? Gilgal is reappearing in the Bible. It's interesting. Each event signifies a life story in the life of Israelites and for us as a church. Okay? Event number, event number 13. Many years later, Gilgal became the starting point of a pilgrimage that actually ended the great prophet Elijah who actually was took up in a whirlwind and the mantle got transferred to Elisha and that place where it took place was called Gilgal. Are you with me? Okay, 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 1 to 14. Okay, late in Israel's history, prophets like Hosea, Amos condemned Israelites for the wickedness and the corrupt worship at Gilgal. Amos associates Gilgal with Bethel in its ruin and disgrace. In the book of Hosea chapter 9 and Amos chapter 4. Both he condemns. Finally, in the course of telling the people of Israel. When they gave a huge recount of what God did. That prophet Micah reminded his people of God's care. In the early days of their life at Gilgal. Micah chapter 6. Verse 1 to 5. Okay? Interesting. So much of Gilgal. You will go back after this Gilgal, Gilgal, Gilgal. That's what will be a resounding. But it is good that one year we remained at Gilgal. And I've taken out events after events in the Bible. Which tell us that Gilgal is a good place for us as a church. We stood there, waited there. We didn't hurry. We didn't push our plans through. We just remain still. And we thank God. Two more days to get over. And we will cross the year of consolidation. Are you with me? What does Gilgal mean? Gilgal in Hebrew means. Hallelujah. It just means circum. There are different meanings or understanding scholars have given. I have taken three meanings of the word. The Jewish people till today believe about Gilgal. The Jewish community pays great attention to the word Gilgal. You can talk to any Jew. Gilgal means three things for a Jew. And I'm going to call it out for us. What does Gilgal mean? First, Gilgal means a place of hallelujah. It means it's a place of new beginnings. Last Sunday, Ashrit prophesied, behold from Isaiah. I am doing something new. Do you see it coming? The prophet asked. Behold, I am doing something new. Do you see it coming? Hallelujah. Okay. It means God is going to do something new. Okay. New beginnings is a journey of NFC. Gilgal for a Jew means a base camp for many battles of the Israelites against their enemies. Hallelujah. We are in the battlefield. Last Sunday, I think Shuni shared on warships, cruise liners. Are you on a warship or a cruise liner? Correct? Stanley gave a prophetic word last Sunday. Those of you remember. Okay? Okay? The aroma of instance, battle, pray, seek. It meant Gilgal experience means it's a battle for some of the biggest battles that we are yet to fight. 
Hallelujah. Third, it was a sacred place that eventually the enemy tried to defile. And he wanted us to keep it sacred and holy because Gilgal will become part of NFC's history as it became part of Israel's history. Are you with me? Therefore, therefore, I've asked Jenny to write the annals of NFC history and she's made a beautiful document which you will release next Sunday, the first Sunday. You must have a look at the document, what happened each year and how the year of consolidation now transits us to the next phase. Many of you will remain to see the day when God has done his work in the Neon Family Church to its fullness to build the kingdom of God. Gilgal meant three things. A place of new beginnings. A place where many battles have been fought. A sacred place. Now you can take this to your personal life also. You as a family can say, 2009 has been a year of Gilgal. New beginnings. Take it as a prophetic word to you. Take it as a prophetic word for yourself. Take it as an individual. But something new is going to happen for us. Are you with me? Okay. So, Neon Family Church, more than a church, is a community of God's people. Are you with me? It's a community of God's people. And I want to sp spend some time here. We are not building church because somebody needs to pay his bills. That's not the intention why we started this church. We wanted to start this church because we are a community that belongs to God. And God's community has certain values and certain patterns and belief systems. And all our patterns evolve from the 66 books of the Bible. Are you with me? Every value comes from here. The word of God is a lamp to our feet. Lamp to our feet. And community of God's people depend on God's community more than their biological community. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone leaves his father, mother, brother, sister, biological mother, biological father, biological sister, he will receive many more in this community. Are you with me, my friends? This is the community that he was talking about. That's what he told his disciples. And God's community is built by God's plan and God's purposes. Are you with me? It is not built by anybody's wins and fancies. It's built on the word of God and our principles come from God's word and we constantly lean on God's word as we build the church forward, going forward. Okay? Place of new beginnings, place of starting. So you are part of a community that is not, you don't say that I'm part of Ashok's community. You're not part of Ashok's community. You're part of a community that belongs to God. And God is building this community. If you walk into this church thinking that Ashok is building the church, then you are gone, man. You will have all the flaws against me. Ashok is bad. Ashok is bad. Ashok is bad. Or if you walk into any of our cells, suppose you walk into a cell of Deepak and Clementina. Oh, Deepak and Clementina cell. Oh, Deepak is bad. Clementina is bad. Penmi is bad. Because you're looking at them. But you look at God, it is his community. And he knows whom to add whom to delete. Book of Revelation, whole tribe got disappeared, a new tribe was brought in. He knows. Let him do his work. You don't end up doing his work. You need to belong to the community of God's people. Whether you like it or you don't like it, Jesus is not coming back for you. He's coming back for this community. Hallelujah. He's coming back for this community. He's interceding for this community. So belong to the community, not like strangers, but like a family. Brother, sister. Jesus didn't say, if anybody leaves his uncle, auntie, you'll have many uncle and aunties. No, 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 no. He didn't say that. <laughs> we are brothers and sisters in the community of God. The chief shepherd is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he is the God's community. So as a church, 
you're belonging to a community of God's people. Are you with me? So our theme for the year 2020-21, we will be a warrior's clan. Because we are a community, we will be a warrior's clan. I know at least six sermons were spoken last Sunday by various speakers, majority of them were women, who spoke on the spirit of God and the armor of God. If you remember, some of you have illustrations were used. Correct? Stanley also spoke one. Okay? The whole warrior clan is a theme as we move forward from 2030. We will be warrior clan. And the warrior clan is known for two things. They are prayer warriors and prayerful builders. Every time you say something, think, am I building the church or am I dividing the church? Am I breaking the church or am I building the church? Think. Because warriors are warriors. Are you with me? Oh, today, I'm not going to the church. Is it going to build the church or is it going to divide the church? Think. Your actions will affect this community. Think before you act. My friends, we want you to be a warrior clan. And warrior clans are always warriors. Whether they sleep or whether they awake. Okay? They are a warrior. And they'll remain as warriors. And warriors that God wants us to be as we enter. We will build, but we will build prayerfully. We will not build because we've got resources. We will pray. We will walk. We will seek. We will ask God. We will wait. Listen to Him. And then build. But we will be prayer warriors. Everything we will pray. Everything in this church will pray. We will battle. We will increase the incense of prayer. I thank God for, for Nim and Burley and Sunni and many of you are part of the prayer teams. Amazing guys. The season of prayer has moved to another level. We want to push it further. The more we are in prayer, the more we will build. Otherwise we will be gossiping people we will be chatting people. We will be backbiting people. We will be dividing people. And I'm going to ask you, church, if you're in for a warrior, sign up to me today. Come up to me after the service and say, count me as part of the warrior clan. And I will give you responsibilities. Take up. Build the church in the way it should go. Don't build it in the wrong direction. So as we move forward, I want to break it down for you. What happens? What does prayer warriors really mean for us as we move forward? It does mean, it does mean. First, in prayer, we will be seekers of God's will and heart. We will know what God's will and what he feels about it. That's what we do in prayer. We want to know, God, what is on your mind? What do you feel about this? Is what we are going to do. Second, we're going to be sensitive as prayer warriors to Jesus and to his mission, evangelism. Are you with me? Okay. And our evangelism is going to sticking to the same policy that I've said to you before. Don't call people from another congregation to become part of this church. Billy Graham said this, the great man of God. Why should somebody receive the gospel twice when there are millions who are dying Without even hearing it once. Church. Don't evangelize to church. Please call people who are a lost son. Lost coin. Or a lost sheep. Because Jesus said. He had compassion on people. Because they were like a sheep. Without a shepherd. If they have a shepherd. Don't invite them. The shepherd will take care of that. Look for sheep. Without a shepherd. Have compassion on them and invite them to the community of God's people. We will be sensitive to Jesus. Everything that we do, we'll have to ask, what does Jesus feel about this? What does he feel? How does he feel if we do this? And second, his mission is evangelism. That's what he told. I'm about my father's business. And my father's business is people. And we will be 
people who will talk to people about Jesus Christ. Okay? And if you want to need motivation, meet Shanta and Babu Uncle, both of them. I think at that age, they are on a firebrand. <laughs> Correct? You should see their perseverance to ensure that a non-Christian receives the gospel. God has given them strength. Talk to them. Ask them, how do you do it? Tell us some tips. Take some ideas. Ask them for some resources. How do you contact people? What do you do to reach the Christ? Do something different. Learn. And we're going to work through those areas. And finally, we will sync our works with the Holy Spirit. We will sync our works with the Holy Spirit. We will be constantly sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we move forward. Are you with me? The three S's of prayer warriors. Okay? Can you quickly... Sorry. Can I quickly? First we will be... Say it loudly. Okay? Now the second part of the, of the theme that I called out is called the prayer builders. How do we build? First, okay, prayer, we will be prayerful builders. So how do we build? First is a plumb line. Today morning, Clementina came and actually shared. When God speaks twice, when God speaks twice, he really means business. Hallelujah. She doesn't know what I'm speaking. She's the only prophet who came up this morning. And she said, the Lord is reminding me to build the church in the plumb line. Hallelujah. And here is my sermon, which is prepared a couple of weeks back. And God knows plumb line. Plumb line is also called a plummet in the Bible. It's a cord which has a non-magnetic weight that hangs at the end. Everything, everything in a building is determined by the plumb line. Okay? No matter what the carpenter wants to build, the plumb line determines whether it is straight or not straight. Nobody's version is relevant there. The plumb line is put. And if it is straight, it is straight. Hallelujah. Jesus himself was a plumb line. And he was called the cornerstone of the building. The plumb line, the cornerstone, determines how the other things of the building has to come. And Jesus is the cornerstone of our lives. Okay? And our, whatever we build, my friends, we will build it straight. We'll build it slow, but we will build it without sin, without compromise, not being pleasers of man, not trying to make people happy, but we will be people like the plumb line that God spoke in the book of Amos and the other Old Testament and Isaiah, a couple of places. Our building will be straight. If you think little compromise is permitted, the answer is no. The answer is no. So we are very strong on certain value systems. We want to be a community that appears holy before God all the days of our life. And one of the ways my leaders, part of my team as cell leaders or as a co-team leaders, they're all going to be people who are going to measure whether the value system in which they're building is correct or not. Are you with me? So they may ask you and they may tell you, they may put plumb line through sessions. My cell leaders may come up to you and say, hey, you've been repeatedly late for cell. That's a plumb line. They're telling you. You're not lifting your voice in worship, plumb line. Either you can react or you can repent and embrace and restitute back to God. But somebody has to tell you. For the builder, somebody has to tell that wall is not straight and that somebody is the plumb line. Are you with me, church? And there is adequate references in the Old Testament that God disliked people who built without the plumb line. And so much so, Ezekiel tells us, they built a temple and Ezekiel walks into the temple and looks at the two corners, the eastern corner and the, and the western corner of the temple. And he finds two idols. One idol is called idol of jealousy. Are you with me? And the second idol 
is called the idol of arrogance. And God tells him, these people have not built the temple right. Ezekiel, go, break up. And I'm going to tell you how to build the temple. Are you with me? Okay, interesting. When you look back at God's word, okay, the plumb line. Okay, Isaiah 28 talks about plumb line. Mark 2 talks about plumb line. Acts 4 talks about cornerstone precious. 1 Peter, Isaiah 28. I've given you adequate references. Amos talks about plumb line. All of them have taken the plumb line. So my friends, whatever ministry you're handling, whether it's ushering ministry, HR ministry, worship ministry, whatever is entrusted to you, my friends, I'm giving you all authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Use the plumb line. Use it. So that you build straight. So what you build will stand the test of time. When Jesus comes, he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You built it straight. Are you with me? The second building, we will be building people. The great commission will be our guide. Are you with me? The great commission will be our guide. As a warrior clan, we will build the church on the Great Commission. We will be constantly going back to making disciples. We don't make converts. We make disciples. Sons and daughters of the Most High God. Okay? You must have, if you have not heard Stanley's message, please hear it. He spoke on sons and nephews. And he says the church needs to have sons, not nephews. Nice message. If you've never heard it, please listen to it or I can send you the link. You must listen to Stanley's message on sons and nephews. He lays emphasis that the church is strong if it's built on sons and daughters, not on nephews and nieces. Not that we are against them, but they don't carry the value system. So our church is going to be built on the lives of people. Third, the church is going to be progressive. Nehemiah built the wall in two styles. You know what did he do? Interesting. He built the whole wall in 52 days. But he did it in two methods. Very interesting. And I'm going to tell you both the methods that he used. He got everybody involved. So in NFC, there is no room for spectators. Amen. Only my son said amen. amen. If you're thinking... We'll just come, nice, cushy time. No, 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 no. Everyone will be involved in building God's kingdom. Nehemiah style. Everybody. He didn't spare anybody. Second, he built the wall in 52 days. Each one was given a portion of the wall to build. Hallelujah. And this is what he told them. You build the wall and you decide how the gate should look like. God will do the synchronization of the entire wall around Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So in other words, I like one of the, uh, the, the rabbis says, in other words, he told them, when you are building the wall, don't look at their wall. Hallelujah. He said, do what is entrusted to you well. That's enough. So we're going to build progressively. Which means, whatever is entrusted to you, you need to ask, have I moved what has been given to me forward or has it gone to die? Okay? So every one of us has to build it progressively. Whatever ministry, whatever responsibility is given to you, you have to do it well because the kingdom has to move progressively forward. And then in a short span of time, we will be able to build what God has called us to build. Okay, Nehemiah did it in 52 days. I'm not saying we'll do it in 52 days, but this is the pattern of how we are going to build. I'm going to take you backward. What is the pattern? Say it loudly. Our people, what will be our guide? I don't know how to build this church. Where is your guide? Your guide is from? Great Commission. Sorry, 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 sorry. No. Progressive. We have to move forward. 
every month you should be able to see that I moved forward in the kingdom of God. I remember last, last Sunday Suni said, if you prayed with one person last month, pray with two people this month. If you prayed with two people last month, pray with three people this month. Last month you only read four verses in the Bible, read four chapters in the month. Do something different, progressive, grow, grow, grow. Move forward. If you only spend 10 minutes in prayer with your wife, spend 15 minutes in prayer this now on. Increase progressively and move forward in the kingdom of God. So how do we do this? And it's interesting. I took a nice uh, verse from the book of Habakkuk. It's a poetry that Habakkuk wrote. And I like this poetry. Let me read it for you. I will stand at my watch. My church, my request, my brothers and sisters, you should be like Habakkuk. You need to stand at your watch. Are you with me? Habakkuk said, as I'm going to see the temple built, Habakkuk said, I will stand at my watch and station myself at the ramparts. Hallelujah. I like Habakkuk's approach. I will look to see what he will say to me. Okay? And what answer I am to give to the complaint. I will write down the revelation and I'll make it plain on tablets. So the herald may run with it. Okay? For the revelation awaits an appointment time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it may linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Hallelujah. What a way Habakkuk had faith. He says, I will station myself on my watch. I will be at the rampage where the enemy is going to come. I will protect the community of God's people. I will constantly listen to what God is saying. I will write it down. I will write down the revelations. I will listen to him. If there are anything that I've got to complain, I will take it to him. Look at his posture. I want to say this to you, my friends. Let this be your posture as you build the church forward. Let this be your posture. You know, I do not know how many of you know the word, meaning of the word Habakkuk. Habakkuk means embrace. Anagra, come. Habakkuk means embrace. Hi, Anagra, this is not embrace. This is not embrace. Hi, Anagra, this is not embrace. Hi, Anagra, this is not embrace. You know what is embrace? This is embrace. Habakkuk embraced God. Embraced God. My prayer as a church, we will embrace God. Each one of us will be called a Habakkuk who embraces God. And that's how our journey is going to begin as we enter the month of January. My friends, be excited. This is not my weight. This is God's weight. As Habakkuk said, he spoke it. It may linger a little bit. East was supposed to be planted in 21, 22 years old. Linger a little bit. But it will come. Because God is the builder. Are you with me? Let's join me in prayer as I pray. You're a warrior's clan. Tell your neighbor. I'm a warrior's clan. Father, we thank you for these five years. Four years of victories and one year of just standing as a year of consolidation. Thank you as a church. Thank you for Gilgal. Thank you for the battles that we have won. Thank you for the new beginnings, a holy place, and a battleground for great conquests. We are ready as a church. This is your kingdom. You are the chief shepherd of this church. And I pray for NFC South, NFC Central, ZF Kanur. This year, as we cast the vision, we will be like Habakkuk. We will embrace God. Stand watch on his watch and be a protector of the rampants and build with the plumb line of God. Thank you for the prophetic word that came this morning. We receive it and we want to say amen to what you have spoken to us. Equip us as we wait the next two days to step into the year 2020 and forward for the things that you have in store. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.